So we talked about the idea that at its at their core, parametric functions generate coordinates. But they generate coordinates by generating x and y values separately. And those values are generated by plugging a value of t, a third value, a parameter, into these two equations. So yeah, I will get one coordinate on this parametric curve, whatever it looks like, we don't know, by taking a value of t, I don't know, 2 maybe, and plugging it into the x equation, so that would be 8, and plugging it into the y equation, that would be minus 1, and that gives me a coordinate. So the same value of t generates both values from the coordinate, and it's that really that we're using to solve problems. The second part of what we did on Friday was this intersection between parametric and Cartesian curves, and this is really neat and easy, isn't it? And I, I don't know whether people have done this, so I'm just going to whiz through it quickly. Here's a parametric function. We don't know what it looks like. We haven't co converted it Cartesian. We're not being asked to. And here's a Cartesian equation. Where they intercept, these two things will be the same, and these two things will be the same. So all we do is we replace that with that. And we replace that with that. It's a really neat trick. And that's going to give us a value of t. So I'm, I'm going to whiz through this because I'm, I think many of you will have already done this. So I've got, in terms of t's, I've got minus 1 plus 3. And I've got 1. So t is minus a half. Now that's not a point of intersection, that's a value of t. So to find the point of intersection, I go and say, right, okay, what do I get when t is minus a half? And see what coordinate that gives me. So I plug minus a half into that equation and into that equation. And that gives me the x and y value in my coordinates. So this is minus 3 halves plus 2, so that's, uh, that's a half. And 1 minus minus a half is 1 plus a half, so that's 1 and a half. Hoping it's right. Looks familiar? Yes. <coughs> So I'd like to go through a couple more examples of this, um, and uh, the first one is question 12 on page 212. Now, I have to say, um, I don't like the way they do this question when you look at the answers, so we're going to do a modified version of this question, all right? So what I want us to do is to firstly work out the value of t where the curve intersects the x-axis. So that's what we're going to do to start with. We're going to do a modified version of this um, question. So I want to know these two points here. So at the end of the day, I want to know these coordinates. And I know that that curve has got x values that are generated by 6 cos t, and y values that are generated by 4 sine 2t plus 2. So the first thing I need to ask myself is what do I know already about those two coordinates? What's always true about points on the x-axis? Which bit zero? The y value is zero. That's right, yeah, yeah. So George clearly has that little flashcard pinned up um, on his, uh, next to the loo, that's right. 
points on the x-axis y equals zero, points on the y-axis x equals zero. So, so what? So what I know is that when y is zero, I'm going to get a value of t. Well, actually, I'm going to get two values of t because there are two points. So what I do is I look at my y equals equation and I say, right, what value of t will make y equal to zero? So I'm only having to look at the y equals equation because I know that on the x-axis the y value will be zero. Now that's going to be an equation in sine 2t. I know that t is between pi over 2 and minus pi over 2, so that means 2t. So if I plot the graph of sine, it looks like that. So get the sine 2t on its own. Shift sine of that value gives you your 2t values, and then we're hoping to find two. We're hoping to find two. So I'm hoping you get minus pi over 6, which is the first solution, and then this solution will be the same distance before minus pi, so that's minus 5 sixths of pi. So those are my two values for 2t. So t will be minus pi over 12, half of that, and minus 5 pi over 12. Those are the two values of t that make y equal 0. So to work out the x value, which is what we're actually after, we just make t equal those same values in the x equals equation. And this is why I said I don't like the way the question answers it, because if I show you the answer, all it does is it just writes 5 cos, and it doesn't even write it as minus pi over 12, because... I don't know why. I mean, pi over 12 and minus pi over 12 with cos are the same because cos is symmetrical. But I didn't like that. So, so, so this value here is 6 cos minus pi over 12. just happens to be the same as that. And this value here is 6 cos minus 5 pi over 12. Those are the two x coordinates. So... I'm going to dig my heels in and say that's an unnecessary complication. And I don't know why they didn't work it out and round it to three sig figs because it's not a particularly nice value anyway. So we work out the values of t that make y equal 0, and then we substitute those same values of t into the x equals equation to get the x values.
So again, I, I keep saying I don't like the way they've done this question. So the next bit we're going to do is we're going to say, right, where does the curve intersect the y equals 4 line? So we don't know anything about this, but it's, let's say it's up here somewhere. Now in the first part of the question, I found the point where it crossed the x-axis by asking what value do t make y equal 0? So Charlie, what am I going to ask for this final part of the question? Yeah, I'm just going to redo what I've just done, but ask what makes, when does y equal 4? Okay, and again, just work out the t values for me. Um, it's not dramatically different to last time. So where does it cross the y equals 4 line? We're just going to ask, right, when does y equal 4? Very, very similar equation. So I'm hoping that you get pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6 because it's plus a half, so it's almost identical. So the two values this time would be plus pi over 12 and 5 pi over 12, which means the x values will be 6 cos pi over 12 and 6 cos 5 pi over 12. Now, as it happens, these two are the same because the cos of that and the cos of that are the same. So what that tells me is that, you know, this, if this is sym symmetrical, then that must be 2, and that's 0, and that's 4. But the pattern of solving that problem revolved around finding the value of t, using one bit of information to find the value of t, and then using that same value of t to work out the second half. So sometimes we know a value of x, so we use that to work out the value of t and then sub that in to work out the value of y. Here we knew the value of y, we worked out the value of t, sub that in to work out the value of x. Before I give you the next question, can I just very quickly do some year one revision with you? Um, it's only that I did this question with the other group and it, we hit, a, hit a, a sort of barrier. So if I said I wanted to know the centre and radius of this circle, I 
I'm wondering if you'd be able to do it. You may remember the technique we use is a double completing the square because we expect the formula for a circle to look like that where we can work out the centre from what's in the brackets. So you need to look at this and this and complete the square for x, this and this and complete the square for y. You've then got some numbers left over, kicking about, which need to be sorted out and shifted over onto the right hand side. Just give you a chance to have a think about that. So I hope you remember that when I want to complete the square for something like that, it's half the number of x's goes in the bracket, because when I grid that out, I get x squared minus 1x minus 1x, which gives me the minus 2x. Unfortunately, I also get a pesky 1, which I haven't got here, so I need to take that one away. Similarly here, if I grid that out, I get my y squared, I get minus 4y minus 4y, sorry, plus 4y plus 4y which gives me my 8y. I also get a pesky 16 which I haven't got up here so I need to take away that 16 and I've got that minus 8 that was sitting there all along. So if I shovel all those numbers over to the left hand side uh, there are 25 of them so I get x minus 1 squared plus y plus 4 squared 25 so the center of that circle opposite of that opposite of that square root of that for the radius okay so this question here is on page 219 question 5 And we're still on solving problems, but we've moved on to something a little bit more subtle, a bit more complicated. The first thing, to show that this is a circle, we're going to have to write it as a Cartesian equation and hope that it looks something like that. I recognise the Cartesian equation of a circle. So this takes us back to last week's work, which was hard, wasn't it? All that stuff with identities. The good news is this is quite nice and easy in terms of the selection of the identity because I can rewrite this as sine t equals something I can rewrite this as cos t equals something so I can use the sine squared t plus cos squared t equals one identity that should give you something that looks a little bit like this which you can then hopefully change into that it's a little bit more complicated but I'm sure you're not so start off by rewriting the two parametric equations as sine t equals and cos t equals.
square a fraction, you can square the top and the bottom separately. That's going to give me some denominators of 144, which I'm going to multiply by pretty quickly. So I don't have any pesky fractions to worry about. So I have um, written, rewritten the identity, replacing sine squared with that squared and replacing cos squared with that squared. I multiplied, I, I squared the fractions but didn't actually multiply that out. Multiplied everything by 144, then multiplied out the brackets. Um, and then the 144s disappear, don't they, which is quite nice. I'm going to carry on over here because I'm out of space. So I've got x squared plus y squared minus 24y equals zero. Now that's good news in terms of writing this as a circle because I've got no other x's. So I know that there's no x bracket, so I know the centre of my circle is going to be zero. So Pat, what's going to go in the y bracket? Um, 12. 12. I minus 12 squared, that's right. That's going to give me y squared minus 24y. It's also going to give me 144, uh, which I don't want. So I have to take that away. The picture is complete. I know the centre of the circle is 0, 12, and the radius is 12. Now all of that's in metres. And this is a Ferris wheel. Now we are in the problem here of um, you know questions in context and some people not knowing what a Ferris wheel is. Um, uh, in examples, we're always uh, criticised for, uh, for using context that people wouldn't have heard of. I call, I call it a big wheel. I guess you'd call it the London Eye, would you? I don't know. But, uh, but uh, Isabel, tell me something about this particular big wheel. Um, <coughs> about its size. It's got a radius of 12. Radius of 12. And what about the centre of the Ferris wheel? How high above the ground is it? Oh, um, 12. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if I sort of drew, drew it on a, an axis, then, you know, its centre is at 0, 12, so it sort of looks like that, doesn't it? And so, Grace, what's the maximum height that it's going to reach? Um. 
centres are 12 and I know the radius? Um, 24. 24, yeah, 24. So I can do that sort of using common sense. I could also do it by looking at the y equation because the height is about y. So if I look at that y equation, it's a bit like the one in the test. I know that cos t is only ever as big as 1 and only ever as small as minus 1. So 12 cos t will be as big as 12 and as small as minus 12. And so I'd have to say, right, when is that going to be as big as it can be? Well, because it's 12 minus that, it's going to be as big as it is when that's minus 12. So 12 minus minus 12 is 24. However, we don't actually need to do that because we know its centre is there, its radius is there, and everything's in metres. The final part of this question is to do with the period of a function. Both of these functions will repeat as t gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and t in this question is time. So it's not limited, it's going to start at zero and get bigger and bigger and bigger. It doesn't say this in the question, but it does say at the beginning of this chapter that uh, angles are always in radians in this question. So before we finish this question, I know I started this question with a bit of revision of circles. Before we finish this question, I just want to do a bit of revision of the period of trig functions. So if I've got y equals sine x, that's a graph which repeats every 360 degrees, or in radians, 2 pi. So the period of that is equal to 2 pi. So can I just get you to write down what the period of these functions would be. So the period of sine x is 2 pi, if we're talking radians. That's how often you get one complete cycle. And as always, it's different, isn't it? So just be careful with that one. Okie dokie, so uh, James, what do you reckon the period of cos 2x would be? Um, pi pi. You're absolutely right, yeah. When you take cos x, which has a period of 2 pi, and change x for 2x, it squeezes it in, doesn't it? It's always the opposite to what you'd expect. So the period will be 180 degrees, or pi radians. And so hopefully you spotted that the reverse is true there, that would be 4 pi radians. So it would take... 4 pi, I don't think it's a number, that's roughly 12, isn't it? It would take 12 minutes to complete one full cycle. And what about tan 2x? I've done a little reminder here. What do you reckon, Harry? What's the period of tan? How long does tan take? Is it 180? It's 180, which is pi radians. So it's going to be half of that, that's right, yeah. Wherever you start on a big wheel, your height goes up and down like this, doesn't it? All right? And think about your x displacement. Well, yeah, if you start at the bottom, then you go sort of out to here, and then you come back again, and then you go out to here, and then back again. That's how your x and your y values change. So, um, 
So, come back, come back, come back. Great, thank you. Honestly. Last budget went on the books. It's uh, yes, that's right, yeah. Uh, so the period of these two functions are both going to be 2 pi. And in this case, that's the values of t, which is in minutes. So it's 2 pi minutes. So one complete cycle of my Ferris wheel is going to take 2 pi minutes. Because that's how long it takes for both of those functions to complete one full set of whatever values it takes. We want to know the speed of the car. Now, speed is distance over time. I've got the time. So, George, what's the distance that you travel if you're sat in the, uh, in the big wheel? What's the distance you travel in one full cycle? Or how could we work it out? Uh, yeah. um, what measurement would that involve? Uh, oh, oh what, what's that? Circumference. circumference, yeah. Circumference of a circle is? Oh. You put me on the spot. Well, yeah. Did, I don't know. I Can you help him out, Tegan? Um, I don't know. I can remember oh, the, the circle song, can we? Pi r squared oh, sounds like yeah. radius area yeah. to me. When it comes to circumference, I just use t pi d pi times the diameter. <laughs> Twenty-four pi, and that's in meters because we're somewhere where it says meters. Yeah. Meters. So speed, distance over time, 24 pi divided by 2 pi, which is 12, and that's metres and minutes. Not that you ever measure speed in metres per minute, but maybe yeah. metres per minute. So the period of the two functions, which in this question was the same, 2 pi, meant that that was how long this Ferris wheel took to complete one complete revolution. And we were allowed to, we were able to then to use that to work out the speed. So what about this question here? So this is on... Page 216. Uh, this is an example question. So here we've got the shape on um, the shape that a skater is making as they skate on the ice. So we're sort of looking down. It's on, yeah, it's on page 216. Um, so they're making this rather beautiful, you know, sort of um, figure of eight shape on the ice as they go around like this. Um, beautiful. We had a great sixth form trip back in, back in the days. We went to Bristol. We took our year 13s to Bristol and we went ice skating in the evening. Stayed at the youth sort and went ice skating. If it wasn't for COVID, we'd do that again, but there you go. Happy days. Um, so, this function is a classic case of one where a parametric function works really well because you've got it's really, really complicated to de describe that in a Cartesian form, but it's it. It's still not straightforward, but it lends itself to parametric form. So this equation is telling us how the skater's x distance varies. And it's clear, this skater, if you think about them starting there perhaps, their x distance, it goes there, and then they go over there, and then they come back over here, and then they go over there. So they're going back. Uh, and the y value is about how far they're going up and down. So it's not height this time, because we're looking at a plan view. So, you know, you can see how the y value goes up and then comes down and then goes... So, here's the question. We're not going to do the whole question. Here's what I want you to work out. I want you to tell me what's the period of that. What's the period of that? And therefore, how long does it take for the skater to complete one complete figure of eight? So, the period is going to be in minutes, because it's t, which is in minutes. And we're still in radians. Okay, everything's in radians. So, what's the? We're not going to answer all this question. We just, well, I just want to know what's the period of that function. What's the period of that function? You're going to get different periods. So, which one of us? Which one of those periods tells us how long the skater takes to complete one complete cycle? 
Good. You don't have a punt at the period of the X. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. So it's two pi over twenty because we've reduced the period by a twentieth because it's been squeezed in with a scale factor of one over twenty, which you're absolutely right. It's pi over ten. And uh, remember, pi over ten is a number. It's three point one four divided by ten, so that's three-ish seconds. All right. Now the y period is a bit more complicated. So what I've done is I've started with sine t, which has a, a period of 2 pi, and I've gone through the steps that you would go through to transform sine t into that, using the order we've previously discussed, which if uh, you haven't remembered it, you always start with any x translations, then anything else to do with the x, then anything else to do with the whole function, finished with any y translations. There weren't any y translations in this case. So when I, uh, James, when I replace t with t minus pi over 3, that shifts the function forwards, pi over 3. Does that change the period? It does not. So all it does is it takes the sine curve and just shifts it forward, pi over 3, which is 60 degrees. It doesn't actually change how long it takes to complete one cycle. It's just been shifted forwards. So circle... The, uh, the cycle will still, will still be there. Isabel, what about when you go from t to 10t? Will that divide by 10? It will divide by 10, right. So, so that gives us pi over 5. And uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. And then t again. If I multiply the whole function by 12, it just stretches it in this direction. Is that going to change the period? No. It will not change the period. So, so the period of the y values is pi over 5. Now again, that's about 3, um, sorry, this isn't 3 seconds, is it? 3.14 divided by 10, it's about 0 0.3 seconds, sorry. Uh, and this is 3.14 three, uh, 3 divided by 5, which is about 0 0.6 minutes, not seconds. <laughs> Um, so what's the period of the whole figure of eight? Which one of the two is it? Smaller one. Isabel's saying the smaller one. Does anyone want to agree or disagree with this? The bigger one. Bigger one no, I changed my answer. It is the bigger one. It's the y one. Now, can anyone explain why it's not the x period? Think about the shape that he or she is, is doing. Going from here to here, your x value goes out, comes here, then goes back to there. You then come to the second part, and your x values are exactly the same. So what you do in one complete figure of 8 is you do that twice. Look at the y values, though. Your y value, as you said, as it goes up, 
and then you come back down again and then you go down so the y value is one complete cycle so that's why this is the period of the whole thing it's pi over 5 rather than pi over 10 because what she's actually I say she that's that's very sexist isn't it I'm assuming if the skater is female um, this skater is completing two X periods in one complete figure of eight. There we go. Right, we are at the point now where we can start finally differentiating parametrics, and that's where we will go next lesson.